war. It's neither glamorous nor fun. There are no winners, only losers. There are no good wars, with the following exceptions. The American Revolution, World War II, and the original Star Wars trilogy. Andor's pretty good too. Wouldn't you rather give it all at once to something real than carve off useless pieces till there's nothing left? Andor is the best reviewed and least viewed of the live action Star Wars shows. The Mandalorian kicked things off with a solid, mostly episodic series, but the Book of Boba Fett and Obi-Wan Kenobi felt like movies that had been expanded into limited series with a lot of filler. After the disappointment of those shows, I had low expectations for Andor. I wasn't sure if this character justified a whole series. Thankfully, the show takes its time to set up a large cast of characters on both sides of the conflict, while slowly establishing their aspirations, obstacles, and personal demons. Andor is a political thriller about a rebel group going to war against fascism, as its titular mercenary finds himself at the heart of several key incidents that will define the outcome of the war. There are no Jedis, and there is no space magic. When there's a gunfight, characters are actually utilizing cover. Stormtroopers actually hit their targets. I don't even remember seeing Stormtroopers in the show until Episode 7. There aren't a lot of distracting CG characters or weird-looking aliens. A few show up near the end and it almost feels out of place. Andor is broken up into four story arcs over 12 episodes, causing some viewers to complain about particular episodes being slow and boring. The episodes at the end of each arc are the most exciting. It's what all the tension is building towards. The action is made greater because we're on the edge of our seats waiting for it. Embedded into the show is a criticism of fascist ideology, which might be something we need given that especially Hitler was trending on Twitter just last week. We really are in the worst timeline, aren't we? But who is Cassian Andor? He's the MacGuffin of his own show, the guy that everyone is looking for, a catalyst for action who eventually becomes a leader and makes a great sacrifice for the rebellion. He's the archetypal Han Solo character, an anti-hero who is only interested in money and self-preservation, but ultimately learns to fight for the greater good. For the greater good. Call it what you will. What I ended up loving most about Andor was not the eponymous character himself, but the large cast surrounding him, all players in the early days of the rebellion against the Empire. I was scrambling to write down character names whenever I could catch them because Star Wars always has characters with really weird names. Andor is incredibly well written, and I thought the slow pace was necessary in letting the scenes and the characters breathe. This is the closest Star Wars has been to prestige television in the realm of Game of Thrones or Better Call Saul. Much of this is owed to the writing of Tony Gilroy, who wrote the original Bourne films, which are known for their strong screenplays. Star Wars has never had writing quite like this. It's complex, dry, and procedural with natural delivery. The acting and direction is strong all around. Stellan Skarsgård gives a monologue so poetic it could have been pulled from Shakespeare. There are wonderful dramatic scenes that allow us to understand and care about these characters without relying on callbacks, fan service, and member berries. It's not an action-heavy show. It's about the character work and the world building as it establishes the relationship between the Empire and its subjects. The tone is grim, and the world is gritty. It's a show written for adults, which my adult brain appreciates. It has good performances all around, though Stellan Skarsgård and Andy Serkis are the highlights. As the Empire tightens control over the galaxy, rebel incursions are increasing. Like with the rise of fascism in Europe leading up to World War II, the upper class are trying to look the other way and go about their lives, but it eventually comes to affect everyone. Future rebel leader Mon Mothma is still a senator here, making deals in the shadows as she has secret connections to the rebel forces. The possibilities for tension are more numerous in this time period, when the Empire is really starting to ramp up its mass incarceration by locking up innocent bystanders with extended prison sentences. We get story arcs for some of the corpo climbing simps within the Empire. Cyril Karn, a young blue-eyed brown noser who has aspirations of becoming a full-fledged bootlicking fascist, and Dedra Miro, ruthless girl boss on the rise who is skilled at the arts of manipulation and torture. Miro's superior is played by Anton Lesser, who played Kyburn in Game of Thrones, and this is a great casting choice. He has the demeanor of a cold-blooded company man. 
The Imperial Security Bureau, or ISB, of the Empire is the equivalent to the Nazi SS, a group of jackbooted thugs eager to commit war crimes and genocide. The agents of the Empire ascend only by climbing over each other, a knife behind every back. The praise of a superior is followed by a warning as betrayal becomes an incentive for progress in a totalitarian regime. The harder the state brings down its boot on the necks of the masses, the more the people are inspired to fight back. The human spirit can only endure so much tyranny before great minds begin to plot and plan on how to go about reclaiming liberty. The first three episodes make up a story arc I will refer to as the Origin Arc. It sets up the incident on the planet of Ferrix that forces Cassian to go on the run. The Origin Arc provides the architecture for the rest of the show. Cassian Andor is a thief and mercenary who is uninterested in the rebellion. I think it's all useless. Better to spit on their food and steal their trinkets. It's better to leave. He's an orphan from the planet of Canari, where the Empire murdered indigenous people. Colonialism metaphor activated. He haphazardly falls into his place in Star Wars history after killing a pair of security workers as they are pursuing him. This is the action that sets the plot in motion. Cyril Karn works as a security guard for the same conglomerate company. Capitalism metaphor activated. Karn is obsessed with justice and order, though every time he tries to climb the corporate ladder, he's kicked back down. He pursues Andor, but fails to capture him, causing more damage in the process, and is forced to move back in with his mother. This character is interesting because he gives us a mirror for Cassian and Andor. He's a young man trying to survive, but on the side of the Empire. Cassian has a loving relationship with his mother, while Karn's mother is constantly berating him. Is that how you've been presenting yourself to the world? That would explain a great deal. We can see Karn has sociopathic tendencies. He stalks a superior officer because he wants so badly to rise in status and punish the opposition. He becomes consumed with a personal resentment towards Cassian and Andor, while Andor likely thinks very little of him. Karn represents the lost young man seduced by the allure of fascism through insecurity about his own masculinity. He's trapped in a soulless bureaucracy, an endless row of cubicles where everything is devoid of personality, human lives treated as nothing more than machinery. The second arc is a heist mission, which introduces a new group of characters while cross-cutting back to Karn's story and Mon Mothma's story. Mon Mothma is being pressured to marry her daughter off in exchange for money to help the rebellion. Her daughter has actually been indoctrinated into a cult-like religious movement that emphasizes traditional values. The senator's husband risks bringing disgrace to the family because of his gambling addiction. And even though these characters are minor players, they're still given more development than in any recent Star Wars project. In other Star Wars shows, characters will meet up, have one conversation, and go on a mission. But here the heist plays out over four episodes. In the first two episodes of the heist arc, the small group of rebels are paranoid, fighting against one another as they plan a mission that could be a suicide run. One member of the group named Skeen doesn't trust the addition of an unknown presence, delivering one of the key lines to the episode about the lingering pain of the oppressed. So the tree remembers, but the axe forgets. The axe forgets, but the tree remembers. Now it's our turn to do the chopping. Andor will later reiterate this sentiment as he tries to convince his comrade that you mean nothing to them. It turns out Skeen was the one planning on betraying the crew for the money, and Andor shoots him without hesitation. It's an our rebellion for you. Oh, I'm a rebel. It's just, uh... Me against everybody else. The heist itself is the third episode of the arc, containing non-stop excitement, and the following episode wraps up the arc with the repercussions of the heist for all of the characters. Two of the characters, Cinta and Vel, play a larger role as they are connected with Luthen, who seems to be at the center of it all, hiding in plain sight as the benevolent owner of an antique store. He and his assistant use encoded language about antiques as metaphors when they're speaking of the rebellion. You need to think of the consequences of losing that piece to another collector. I'm preparing for every outcome. Mom Mothma's own driver has to be distracted when she visits here because the driver has been put in this position to spy on her. 
Trust isn't gained easily under imperial rule, where everyone is encouraged to narc on each other. The political themes become more overt in this chapter of the show. Andor meets Nemec, who is writing a manifesto. Aren't those the hats that communists wear? Fun fact for the day, it's called an Ushanka. So this could be Star Wars' version of Marxism, or it's supposed to be like Thomas Paine's Common Sense, the first pamphlet to advocate for American independence. Andor will later read out loud some lines from the manifesto, but the metaphor is loose enough for multiple interpretations. The rebels use the cover of a natural phenomenon which the indigenous people have built a ceremony around. Over the years, the Empire has replaced the ceremony of the native people with an artificial phenomenon. The Empire is a colonialist enterprise interested in extinguishing people's religious beliefs to maintain complete control. As the series progresses, Imperials are turning on one another and the common people are finally inspired to stand up and fight. For Andor's adopted mother Marva, it begins with simply feeling okay to walk down Rick's road, where, in order to send a message, the Empire hung her partner Clem. Clem is the name Andor uses when he accompanies the rebel mission because not everyone can be trusted and secrecy is of the utmost importance. Marva stays in Ferrix to join the rebellion, but Cassian flees with his money to avoid getting caught up in the conflict. He ends up getting slapped with a six-year prison sentence for loitering. That's living in a dictatorship for you. The third arc is the Prison Break arc. We know Andor is not going to serve a six-year prison sentence, yet watching a group of indoctrinated slave laborers slowly find the courage to revolt is fascinating and engaging. The prison on Narkina 5 basically runs itself. The floors can be used to shock the prisoners. The guards wear these really ugly looking boots. There's a repetition built into this story arc as we see the monotonous procedure of the work camp, and how people are reduced to numbers and drained of all personality under authoritarianism. There's also a critique of capitalism at play here, as the prisoners are pitted against one another for rewards or punishments. The Empire utilizes the carrot and the stick, an artificial game to make the enslaved forget about the rebellion and the fighting going on outside as to keep them docile. The prisoners are all used for slave labor to build weaponry. Longtime Star Wars fans will notice that they are putting together pieces of the Death Star. It appears to be part of the canon that will eventually kill Cassian Andor later down the line in Rogue One. We're reminded of the idea that the tree remembers while the axe forgets, as Andor tries to convince the lead prisoner, Kino, that no one is listening to their conversation. Kino commands the crew to meet their quota, but he is a prisoner himself, just counting down the remaining shifts until his freedom. When a rumor begins that a whole cell block was exterminated, a wave of panic passes through the men. An older prisoner is worked to death, and the guards have called for a body bag before he's even pronounced dead. The doctor tells Andor and Kino, I can't help him. I can't help anyone. Which is not exactly the attitude you want from a doctor. He's just as much a prisoner as they are. Andor and Kino use this as an opportunity for uprising and escape. The prisoners have been conditioned through Kino's voice, so what do you think happens when he commands them to attack? As with the heist arc, everything is methodically building towards the escape. We don't get a bird's eye view until the men are all freed. It's a liberating shot. As the men are diving into the water below, tears fill Kino's eyes as he reveals that he doesn't know how to swim. The irony that the man who leads the rebellion won't be able to benefit from the changes that it brings. It's the ultimate form of sacrifice, which is also the sacrifice Cassian Andor himself will eventually make. There is a deus ex machina in the writing that gets Andor from Narcana 5 back to Ferrix, which was a rare instance in the show where I felt like events weren't playing out naturally. The final arc brings everyone except Mon Mothma to Ferrix. I will refer to this as the funeral arc, as the event is all centered around the death of Andor's mother. In his absence, she embraced the revolution. I've been sleeping. I've been turning away from the truth I wanted not to face. The season climaxes as Marva planned for her funeral to be a spark of the rebel uprising. As with the rest of the show, the tension increases slowly, with the funeral procession accelerating into complete chaos as the season is brought full circle. Andor is surprisingly good. 
Its low viewership means it might remain a cult favorite, though it could draw more attention when it closes out its story in Season 2. I'm going to give this a higher score than I ever thought I would. Andor is getting a 9 out of 10 from me. I'd rank it as an A-tier show, with Mandalorian in the B-tier, Obi-Wan Kenobi in the C-tier, and The Book of Boba Fett in the D-tier. Andor is well-written and directed with a great cast. It weaves different character arcs together in a grand, sophisticated manner. One of the moments that stuck out with me the most was Luthen's monologue towards the end of the season. It begins when Supervisor Jung, who is Luthen's man on the inside, approaches him and reveals that ISB knows about a planned rebel attack. Luthen can't warn the rebels because he'll risk alerting the Empire or exposing his inside man, so he has to let all these people die. Jung has just become a father and wants out of his dangerous position, but Luthen tells him that he's so deeply embedded in the Empire they'll never let him leave. Luthen won't let Jung leave either. He is wearing all black, his cape fluttering in the wind, but he's still not a villain. We're just shown that he's a complex individual and that hard decisions have to be made in wartime, that everyone is going to have blood on their hands. Jung asks Luthen whether he has personally sacrificed anything for the rebellion, and Luthen responds, <clears throat> I've given up all chance of inner peace. I've made my mind a sunless place. I share my dreams with ghosts. I wake up every day to an equation I wrote 15 years ago, from which there's only one conclusion. I'm damned for what I do. My anger, my ego, my unwillingness to yield, my eagerness to fight, they've set me on a path from which there's no escape. I yearn to be a savior against injustice without contemplating the cost, and by the time I looked down, there was no longer any ground beneath my feet. What is my sacrifice? I'm condemned to use the tools of my enemy to defeat them. I burn my decency for someone else's future. I burn my life to make a sunrise that I know I'll never see, and the ego that started this fight will never have a mirror, or an audience, or the light of gratitude. So what do I sacrifice? Everything! Everything.